Well, I've been told uh, if I could also, before I start to preach here, just a little bit uh, update from our crusade ministry. How many has never heard about gospel outreach, uh, our ministry? I don't believe you over there. You have. All right. How many were here last time I was here? Okay, wonderful. Um, we uh, started gospel outreach in uh, 2004 and with that uh, one purpose of reaching the lost. We go and we preach uh, mainly toward unreached areas, um, which means at the moment we have a lot of focus on um, West Africa, on, uh, in Asia and, uh, and so on, where we do uh, mass crusades. And uh, we always try to um, uh, get all the local churches to join in, and we hope to give them a lot of positive problems afterwards with having a lot of new people that they need to follow up and get in their churches. And we are always rejoicing when we hear reports back and say, well, our church is doubled or tripled or even more, and we have a new problem. We don't have enough seats anymore. And so that's what makes us really joyful. Also, we, uh, uh, we go to places where there is a great need of new churches to be planted. Uh, so we also try to plant churches afterwards. And by the grace of God, we are over these past 10 years heading really close now to have started 150 churches in locations where there are no church. Sometimes there's not even been one Christian in that town. And um, some of the churches has maybe 30 or 40 people. Others has beyond 1,000 people attending every Sunday. So in total, I... A conservative estimation would be, I think, those 150 churches is about some, somewhere between 15 and 20,000 new believers. And we're talking about new believers. We're not talking about eight Methodists and two Pentecostals and five Baptists that is joining together because they finally agree on something. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about churches with all brand new believers. Where we then send out a, a pastor or assign a pastor to go there and take uh, care of that new church. We just came back from the nation of Benin. Do you know where Benin is? Anybody? That's one, two. It's in West Africa, a wonderful country. This is our second crusade there. The first one was really a hard one in the nation of, uh, in the city of Ouida. That was the city that 20 years ago that the president himself on that location where we had the crusade, and we found out exactly the same dates, actually, also, in the same city where the president 20 years before had dedicated the nation to the devil. And uh, we had a great uh, crusade there. And I was just told that after that crusade, now, buckle up now, 20 new churches were started. Isn't that good? I think it's good. Plus, the existing churches has just grown tremendously. And they say in many of the churches, it's like a revival is just going on and on and on. And now, two weeks ago, we just came back from another crusade in Benin. We have a two minutes footage from it. So if we can see that, that'll be really good. Thank you. Dear partners and sponsors, greetings here from Alabe uh, in the nation of Benin. As you can see behind me, thousands have received Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we have seen miracles every night, blind eyes, uh, deaf ears open, many that has been uh, paralyzed or disabled has been healed by Jesus, and uh, mighty things has happened. We expect many great things to take place, many churches to be filled, many new churches to be started after this crusade. Thank you for supporting this.
able to stand e va a prendere il piede no walk at all e galenza si muti zonia But tonight, we are about to be so strong in the world of the world. Let's be better with you to the best of the world. We start to come from the world of the world. We start to come from the world of the world. We start to come from the world of the world. Amen. Touch my nose. I want to read all. 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 Praise the Lord. This is just a, just a few, few things to show. I don't remember, I don't recall any crusade we had had where we had seen so many lame people starting to walk. It was just every night. And of course, I know he was walking a little bit stiff-legged, but I don't know if you have tried to sit in, the, in your sofa, your couch all night, watching NFL or something like that, and then all of a sudden you need to get up, and I, you, know, ah, you also need to get started. Do you, can you imagine not being able, not even to stand for 15 years? Of course, uh, muscles and joints and everything needs to be, you know, warmed up and uh, going again. And we just had so many tremendous miracles happening like that. And I just know that's like God is also leaving a business card in doing that. Because they will go and tell. They're all known for the, 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 the boy that could not hear and the different things. So... You know, they will start to witness. They will start to bring people to the churches and so on. Well, if you want to know more about what we're doing, there's a little brochure in the back. Um, we have last month, uh, we started our own entity here in the United States. So all the paperwork is done and uh, we have an office here now and a couple taking care of all of it. And you can read more about this in this brochure in the back. Also, if you want to receive our email newsletter, we send it out like 10 times a year. We do about 10 crusades every year. Uh, then um, you can sign up here and uh, tick the, the box here and say we would like to receive that and write your name and address and email address and please, please, please print. I'm not good in reading doctors' writing, you know, when they just go like that. So. Please, if you would like somehow to support us uh, with a one-time uh, donation, you can tick that. Or if you want to be partnering with us monthly, um, we would really appreciate that. Uh, you are $10, you are $20, reach long in those nations. We have found out that $2, $2, <coughs> Costs, it, uh, does it cost us to bring the gospel to a Muslim or to a Hindu or an unreached person somewhere around the planet? Two dollars. How much is a McDonald's meal? That's like six, seven dollars, isn't it? And you know, that will feed you for what, two hours? And we bring the, the, the really true bread of life to these people uh, for two dollars. And uh, we believe we can reach way more people way more than we are doing now. We can put in more buses, bring people from surrounding villages, uh, you know, to pull them in. And uh, by monthly support, that is a great help for us. You can, uh, so take a brochure, it's in the back. We, this is our last day here in uh, Florida. And I didn't expect to hand out that many brochures. So uh, we have just a few left. So you can fight and kick to get one. That's OK. Um, my wife, Lisbeth, will be in the back at the end of the service. Also, if you have any questions of any kind, we will be happy to, to answer them, or at least try to answer them. All right, are you all good? Yeah. Let's. Pray, Lord, I thank you for your living word. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will speak to us this morning. Make your word alive in our spirit, Lord. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. The title of my sermon this morning is The Three Voices. The Three Voices. I believe 
There's three voices speaking to the church all over the world in these days. And um, I believe we live in special times. Already pastor has shared about that. We live in special times. There's never been in the history of time of, uh, like this. Not in the, in the history of the church. Never has the church worldwide grown as much as it is in these years. Never has the church been so persecuted as in these years. Do you realize that about 100,000 Christians every year uh, are killed because of their faith? There's never been a time or a season like this in the whole history of the church where the power of God is moving in a way as it is right now. If you t told me when I was a young man that we would start to see those things, and this is not something unique, it's like that in every crusade, everywhere we go. Tremendous miracles. And I am just a simple Danish guy. There's nothing unique or special to me. I don't have anything that, that is not available for all of us. And if somebody has said to me, you know, you'll start to see, you know, so many tumors go and uh, so many um, uh, thousands of miracles that, that is actually recorded. I would say, no, no, you know, nobody sees that. But and this is not something unique. It's like God is moving in a, in a manner and in a way that we have ever, never seen in the history of the church. At the same time, it's an urgent time for the church. It's not the time to sit down, it's a time to hear the call from heaven. The first voice is actually a voice from heaven. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel in er uh, to every creature. And then it continues, He who believes and get baptized, and so on and so on. There's a voice calling from heaven to his church today. That somebody must rise up and go and reach the lost. Reach the unreached. There's still way beyond a, a billion people that has never ever even heard the name of Jesus being preached in a biblical way. They might have been seen, you know, or a plastic cross somewhere, or, 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 or somehow, you know, um, heard that there's something called Christianity, but they have never ever been presented uh, to the gospel. There's a voice from heaven where God is speaking to his church that more than ever we live in times where we must reach out to the lost and unreached people. I truly believe that, that this is what is the most urgent and most important at all in the Bible and is really in the heart of Jesus right now. It has been ever since he, he paid on the cross, I know that, but I think more than ever this is really urgent for him. That's also why I believe and I think that, that you know, the Great Commission is is uh, mentioned or quoted or reported four times in the Bible. I cannot come up with anything else that in the Bible has been recorded four times. I really believe this is the heart of God. Let me give you a great example. We live on a, on a, in a small town in Denmark. There's no shops at all there. So if we have to go and do some shopping or buy anything, we will have to drive for, um, um, what, 10 miles or something like that. And if I told my, my wife, um, you know, I'm going to town, I have a few errands, and then Lisbeth is saying to me, do you mind as you're going anyway to, to buy some bread and bring with her, you home to us? And I'll say, of course, honey, I will do that. And then I go to the car, I start the engine, I start to drive out of the driveway, and then my wife is waving, you know, from the, from the door, you know, to get my attention, and I stop, and I roll down the window, and then she says to me, I just want to remind you, remember to buy bread, okay? And I said, of course, honey, you know, I never forget anything. <laughs> and uh, I go to town, and on the way there, all of a sudden, my cell phone is calling, and it is... Well, it's my wife calling. That's always great, isn't it? 
And I pick up the phone and I say, hello, darling. And she says, hello, sweetheart. And I ask, how are you doing? Anything new? It's only three minutes uh, since I left, but we never know. <laughs> and she said, no, no, I, I actually just call you to remind you to remember, please, to buy, what do you think? Bread. Bread. And I said, you know, I will, no problems. We hang up and you say, no, not good night, but goodbye, baby. And all of that, you know, and I go to town, I do my business. And then all of a sudden, from my pocket, a strange sound is coming. It's saying like, beep, beep. I pick out the phone. I got a text message. Who do you think I got a text message from? <laughs> huh? My wife is from my wife. I open up the message and it says just one word there. Bread. Now let me ask you a question. What do you think will happen if I come back home with no bread? Four times. Four times I was reminded that this is very important to know. Do you realize it's recorded four times in the Bible? Actually, there is also a fifth in the Gospel of John. Four times. Let, let me make it easy on you today. Four times that we must go and we must be witnesses and we must go and reach the lost. There's a voice from heaven calling to the church today that every vision any church must have if it is on the bottom line a matter of reaching the lost, to be honest, then I doubt it's truly a vision from God. Because this is the very issue. This is the very reason. This is the very heartbeat that is in heaven at the moment that we must reach the lost. That was the first voice. The second voice we read about in the book of Acts chapter 16. All the scriptures is from at chapter 16 this morning. So if you cannot remember anything, then try to remember chapter 16. All right. The second voice is from the nations. In Acts chapter 16, we read about Paul. <clears throat> and um, one night he has a vision. Verse 9 and 10. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of, of Macedonia stood and, and pleaded with him saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought um, to go to Macedonia concluding that the Lord has called us to preach the gospel to them. There's a voice from the nation in these times. This was actually what was bringing the gospel to Europe. And you all know that from Europe, the gospel came to the United States. Many immigrated from Europe to bring, to get a, a new and a new start and a a new beginning over here in the United States and the church, a church we were pastoring in the past, they told us how, you know, uh, in the, I think it was in the 20s or 30s, one, how half of the church within a short time, a few weeks, immigrated to the United States. This was how the gospel came here. Because, but it all began because Paul did hear the voice from a nation. The nation of Macedonia. And me traveling around to many different nations around the world. And going to what is often considered very dark and difficult nations. I hear the same calling again and again and again. I have so many examples. How from the nations there's a great voice calling to the church. Sometimes they don't even know it's the church they're calling on. You've all heard about the Arabic uh, spring that took place, what, two, three years ago? To be honest, you know, it was really a call that something must change. And we are in great despair when that young man in Tunisia poured oil on himself and lit his own body in fire 
That was a call, a yell, that somebody must help us. Now they all believe it was because they have dictators and so, and now the second round is turning, <laughs> is going there, and they started to realize that, well, maybe it's not only political that change needs to happen. I was told recently that now Tunisia, the Muslim nation of Tunisia, has, has changed their Muslim laws to give freedom to all religions. Think, can, think about that. Somebody starts to realize that there must be a change. There's a call from the nations. I was in Cameroon recently. In the north of Cameroon, it's a strong Muslim area. Not many are going there. A terror group is really um, um, terrifying there. It's called Boko Haram. You might have heard about them. And I came to that city. And I, I immediately asked the, the Christians there, have you made an appointment with the governor? You always try to meet with governors and senators and police officers and so, because these are great men of influence. We need them to be not against us, but for us. And we need to try to reach them. And they looked at me with scary eyes and said, no, he's Muslim, he's Muslim. We cannot just contact him like that. I said, but have you tried? No, but, but. I said, please go and get an appointment. I'm sure that uh, he will receive me. And he did, right away. And I came in there and I sat down with him. He was sitting there in the full, you know, Islamic uh, dressing what do we call it, uh, with his uh, big guy, you know, with his hands on the desk and just sitting like this, staring at me. And I said, sir, I'm here to bring peace uh, to, your, to your city. I'm here to that I believe God can make a change here. And I just continued on and on and on with all the blessings that I know the gospel is containing for every place we are going. He was just sitting there staring at me. And when I finally shut up, he said, you know what? We have great many problems here. And you have the solution. A Muslim, a Muslim governor. He was what they call an al Hajj. He had been in, in Mecca worshiping and you know, he just had all the right Muslim titles. But he said, we have so many problems. And you, coming with the gospel, you have the whole solution for it. And we have heard this again and again and again. One time in Bangladesh, as we finished our seminars, we always have seminar in the daytime, as we finished the seminar, and there are not many believers, there's not many Christian leaders in Bangladesh. It's a nation with less than 0.4% believers. And out of them, I mean, many is just by name. Because they were brought up in a Catholic church or uh, in a Christian environment. So we had a very small seminar there. Maybe 20 people attending. And at the end, all of a sudden, 12, 12 or 15 men walked in the, in the seminar place. And the way they were dressed and everything, I could tell that I'm in trouble now. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. And they came and, you know, I wanted to shake hands. They were a little bit hesitant, you know, to shake hands with an unclean guy like me, as they call it. And uh, they said, we are sent from the Secretary of Health. From this minister. We are sent directly from him to talk with you. I said, all right. I said, let's sit down. And immediately as we sat down, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, tell them this. I said, sir, you can all ask all the questions you want. We have nothing to hide. But let me just, as a beginning, start to share a little bit. And I started to share everything that I felt the Holy Spirit had put in my heart. I said, you know, we are here to do good. We believe in God can do miracles. You also believing. I didn't say they were believing in the, we are believing in the same thing, you know. We believe in Jesus. He can do miracles. You know, Muslims also believe in Jesus can do miracles. We are praying for the sick. We don't tell anybody to stop 
going to hospitals or doctors or anything. We don't charge one penny. We pay it all ourselves. And I just continued like that on and on and on and on and on for like 10 minutes. Then I closed. I said, now you can ask any question you want. And they just looked at me and said, you know, every question and every issue we had, you have already answered. And we talked, did some small talks. One of them even at the end leaned over to me and said, you know, I also believe in Jesus, he said. <laughs> and before leaving, we officially had from the Secretary of, Min of Health Department in Bangladesh an invitation to come back and continue what we are doing. Amen. Why? <laughs> Why? Because there is a cry from the nations for help. There's a cry from the nations. I was in Pakistan. We had like, well, at least 15,000 people standing there. Then one night, one of the leading imams and political leaders, he came up on the platform during the meeting. And he said, can I have the mic? What do you do if I don't give it to him? I have a problem. If I give it to him, you most likely also have a problem. I said, you know, all right. And, you know, and then I went back and I just prayed, Lord, you either, you know, take us away now or you take charge of this. And then this man, all dressed up, the political leader, the, the, the imam for that whole area, in front of 15,000 people plus, he says this, I've been sitting in my home uh, two miles away. We always make sure to have a good loud system, uh, a PA system. <laughs> I've been sitting, I've been he hearing every message. I've been hearing all the testimonies of what God has done. I have come here tonight to tell all of you to please pay close attention to this because this is something good. And my jaw was hanging out. What? <laughs> I'm here to steal all his people from the mosque and put them in a church. And he even asked people to listen and pay attention to this. How come? There's a cry from the nations. Somebody come and help us. It's like when Jonah was on that boat. Remember what, when the boat was going up and down? It says that everybody started to cry out to their God. They didn't know what to do. They don't know who to call on. How shall, as Paul writes in Romans, how shall they call on him if they don't never hear about him? There's a call from the nations to the churches today. It's not the time to sit down and just build, you know, walls around and, and oh yeah, we can, we can keep it here and we will just, you know, all of that. And, you know, I truly believe that every believer should fulfill the Great Commission. And it says that we should preach in Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. What? Is it starting in Jerusalem? Well, it started there, but when they didn't move, God sent persecution. You see, if we don't go by ourselves, God has his ways to spread the gospel instead of. I believe there's people here that is called to missions. I believe there's people here that is called to, to support missions. You know, there's two ways where you and I, we can reach the end of the world. And that's often where we are going. You can go yourself. But if you don't like to go to Pakistan, if you don't like to go to Bangladesh, if you don't want to go to Al-Qaeda areas and Boko Haram, how can you then be involved? Well, you can send somebody else. When we are going to be accountable for our life and how we spend our life, you know, we can only bring souls with us from here. But maybe you say, oh, but I'm not an evangelist and I don't feel called to do this and that. That's all right. But we are all called to be involved. Some years back, I was in Romania, and I met a great American guy there. And he told me that he had been working on a, 
on an aircraft carrier. And I always wanted to, to see uh, you know, an aircraft carrier. And I think I find them very impressed. So, you know, and I had this imagination, man, he's one of those hardcore Navy SEALs, this boy, you know, that's really going and doing it. And, you know, so I was asked, so, uh, so what did you do? And he looked at me and he said, you know, well, <clears throat> my, my task is to fuel the planes. And maybe he could, maybe he could see in my face I was a bit disappointed, you know. <laughs> uh, okay. Fuel the planes. Yeah, he said. And they say to me, if I don't do it, we will lose the war. He had never dropped one bomb himself. He had never shot one shot himself. But he was doing his part. Causing the army to win the battle. There's a voice from the nations. Number three. And this is a serious one. From Gospel of Luke chapter 16. chapter 16, Jesus is telling a parable about the rich man and Lazarus, and how, you know, the rich man, he had a lot of riches, and Lazarus, he was so poor, just laying at the rich man's door, and, uh, uh, you know, you know, probably know the, the parable already. And then they, they both die. You know, that day will come for all of us. And um, then they describe, Jesus starts to describe how Lazarus came to paradise and, and how the rich man came to, um, came to, um, to hell. And j let me just make it clear, the poor guy did not go to heaven because he was poor, okay? <laughs> and the rich guy did not go to hell because he was rich, okay? But they just ended up in two completely different eternities that is real. And then this rich guy, he starts to cry out. He says, isn't there any way where I can be transferred from this horrible place over to you? And the reply is, no, there's, there's no way. You see, there's this huge, uh, what do you call it? Chasm. Chasm? You do understand my English, huh? <laughs> you know, between there's no, there's no way of crossing over now. And then this rich man, he starts to say, Oh, but, but could you then at least send somebody to tell my family about this? that they will not end up in this horrible place as I am in right now. Would you please send somebody? And I truly believe that Jesus did not just take this parable out of nothing. When Jesus is giving parables, it's always about real life and real things. He's not coming up with something with spaceships and something like that, right? It's always, you know, about a farm or about something. So I believe this is also real. I believe if we could have a live uh, reporter, I don't know who, who would want to volunteer, though, to go down there, if we go on the screen right now for just two minutes, send a live report from Hill, I think we would hear the same things. A lot of, you know, agony, all the pain, all the torment, all the horrible things. And people, when the report is coming and saying, you know, what do you think? I think they would all say the same thing. Oh, please, if somebody would go to my nation, if somebody would go to my neighborhood or to my family, is there somebody that would be willing to go and at least give them the chance to either reject or receive Jesus Christ that they will not end up here? Will somebody please, please go? You know the founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth, he said this, every believer should when they became saved, be able to look for 20 seconds down to hell. 
for 20 seconds. That will cause two things. Number one, they would never ever backslide. <laughs> they would never backslide. They will keep themselves so tight to Jesus Christ and the cross. Amen. And number two, they would have a passion for the lost. Because when they see, and this is real, my friend. I know it's maybe not the, you know, a happy, clappy sermon this. But this is a truly what I believe is a message. I preach this in many different nations. Because we live in a season like this. Danish television is not the most holy channels in the world. But there was one night some time back, I was, you know, uh, what to call it, flipping channels <laughs> to see if there was some good football or something like that, what you call soccer over here. And, you know, then all of a sudden I stopped at a channel. There was a documentary. It was a series of six uh, documentaries called Life After Life. This was not a believer making this. But at that time, I'd only seen this one of them. He was interviewing people that has a near-death experience. And one of them was a, a young girl, a young, average Danish girl in her 20s. She was not into bad stuff. Neither was she a churchgoer. She never believed in anything truly. I mean, she was just living an average life with an average job and having a nice life and everything was okay. But then she got sick, and her treatments caused an allergic reaction. So she swallowed, swallowed her own vomit, and it came into the lungs, and she passed away like that. And she said, it was like I closed my eyes, and when I opened the eyes again, I was in hell. There was immediately these two creatures starting to torment me. And this was going on and on and on. Be remember, this is one who don't believe in anything. This was going on and on and on. They were cursing me. They were, they were uh, you know, doing, you can't mention it. And the torment, the torment, she said, was horrible. But the worst was that I knew that this would have no end. There was no hope. This girl who don't believe in anything, she said, I knew this would be forever. The rest of my life would be like this. And the reporter, you know, was very excited. So, so what happened then? And then she said, well, all of a sudden, I was still there, but it was like it all took a break. You see, I have a, I have a Christian friend. And later on, I was told that she started to pray intensively for my life. It was like those short breaks, she said. And the reporter asked, you know, he, it was like, you know, he don't believe it, but it was a great story. So what did you do then? She said, I called on Jesus like crazy. And what happened then? Well, it was like I opened up my eyes again. And I was back in the hospital. And my Christian friend were there. She got a second chance. But it will be some out of 0, 0. 0.000 so something that will have an extra chance like that. And then the reporter asked her, so what did you do then? And then she said this, if you have ever been to hell, you cannot but believe in Jesus and call on Him to be your Savior. Today, she's attending in a church. The whole family is attending in the church. They worship Jesus. They follow Him. She was lucky. But what about all those who don't get that extra chance? There's a call from hell to the church today. There's a call, a voice from heaven. There's a voice from the nations. And there's a voice from
from hell to the church today. Can anybody tell me what is more beautiful, what is more precious, what is more important than bringing the lost to Jesus? There's nothing, is there? And maybe you say, but, but I'm not an evangelist. But, 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 but I, I, I feel comfortable staying here. Listen, we all need, we need everybody on board. This is not a pleasure ship. This is a battleship, a rescue boat for lost souls. Maybe you have lost souls in your family. You should keep praying for them. You should keep being that witness to them. Where will we go? Right now in Denmark, there's like a new move, a grassroot move starting coming up. This is people, people just like you and me, that goes out Friday night, Saturday night, go to the shopping malls and everywhere and just ask, can I pray for you? Are you sick? And the people say, yeah, I'm sick. Can I just pray for you? And the number of healings and miracles they see is just tremendous. Some of them, they lead to the Lord. Others just get that that blessing. You see, there is no superman in the kingdom of God. And God looks down on us. He just sees children. Amen. Children. I would like for us, I know this is a serious message. Don't worry, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> but I do believe it's a voice from God, from the word of God. That we need, I need to hear this myself again and again. That this is truly the reason I exist. All the other things. And it's okay to have a nice house, a nice car, and all of that. We have been blessed with this as, as well. It's all fine. But to be honest, to be honest, it's just temporary things. That has no eternal value. Can we close with a prayer? And then also we will, as we close the service here, I would like to give opportunity. <clears throat> if any of you would like us to pray for you, if you are sick in your body or you need help for something, but I suggest we can close the service and people can then come and, and we can minister unto them. Can we all please just close our eyes and bow our heads right now? Let me just, first of all, as I always do in any service I'm in, whether it's a crusade or it's in a church morning like this, let me just ask, maybe you have never in your life made Jesus Christ your Savior. Somebody maybe brought you this morning, or, or maybe your spouse is a Christian, and you, you go to church together with, with him or her, and just to be nice, but you yourself say, no, thank you, I, I don't believe in, in all of that stuff. But the coffee is good here, and the fellowship of people are friendly here, and so. But you know, that's not going to take us to heaven. You need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And maybe already all of you have. But if you don't, if I ask you directly face to face, is Jesus your sa personal Savior? And you say, I, I, I don't know, I'm not sure, I don't think so. I've never made that decision. Why don't you do it this morning then? You know, there's a heaven prepared and waiting for you. God loves you. He wants you. Spend eternity together with Him for always. But down here you need to make a decision for Jesus to be your Savior. With every eye closed, with every head bowed, is there anybody who wants to make that decision? Then just lift your hand and let me see your hand right where you're seated before we close with prayers. Anybody? Anybody? Just take courage. If everybody is already on their way to heaven, that's just beautiful. Let me ask another question. That's to all of us. I sense some of you have really been <laughs> uncomfortable with why I've been preaching. And you wonder, but how will it cost? What will it cost for me to start to do this? 
Well, I can tell you one thing. I said that myself many years ago. If anybody asked me, you know, and said that I would start to preach the gospel, I would say, no, thank you. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm not gifted in standing in front of people. I'm not gifted in this or that. But after I received this calling and I went on with it, I would say, the cost is small compared to all the blessings and all the, all the, the benefits that comes along with it. Maybe God is calling you to, to pray. Maybe God has called you to support. Maybe God has called you and given you the gift and the, the talents that you have for, for a reason. To serve His kingdom. Maybe you're a businessman. You're not just a businessman. You're a Christian businessman. Doing business to reach the business people and to support the kingdom of God. Whatever you have been given is for one purpose. To reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or maybe you say, oh, but I'm, I'm, I'm more into this discipling people. That's wonderful. That means that we take a person, disciple it, that that person will start to be a witness and a servant of God. But we all are called to be witnesses. A witness is one telling what Jesus has done to your life. And I would like to close with a prayer. And if you want to be included in it, you just feel that you will dedicate yourself to the Lord as he's saying, as we sang in a song, you know, uh, uh, who will go? You, know? you will respond back and say, I'll, I will, whatever God has given to me, I will serve to reach people with this. No matter in what environment, no matter where it is, I will serve in this. Then as we pray, just put your hand upon your heart. And from your heart, just say to the Lord, here I am, send me. I want to be part of this. I've heard the voices, and I want to be part of this. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you have saved us. I thank you, Jesus, for your blood, that you have made us qualified to go to heaven. Not because of our own greatness or our own deeds, but, but because you are great. Because you are the Savior. And Lord, I pray as we, as we pray this morning, Lord, and we say to you, here I am, send me. Use me to build your kingdom. Use me to be a witness. Use me to reach people with the gospel. With whatever talents and gift that you are given, to every single one of us here we are use me use me for your great purpose thank you Lord that you have all counted us qualified qualified to be your co-workers in fulfilling the great commission and Lord if our ears has been a little bit dull recently and or if our attention has been a little bit caught up in, in all the business of life Lord, then we ask you to reignite us with a burden and a heart for the lost. With your heartbeat, Lord, let it be our heartbeat. I thank you for this church. I thank you for these precious families and people here that all belong to you, Lord Jesus. I pray this church will go like a, like a wildfire from heaven and will reach many, many people with the true fire from God. Oh, Lord, I pray that, that you will send people, but I also pray that you will send these people to people and take them by hand. And one by one, we'll see how many people will get saved and will call on you to be their Lord and their Savior. Thank you, Lord, for the leadership, for the pastor of this church, for guiding them and giving them direction. Lord, we pray for great opportunities to be your witnesses, to go and do your business in this area, in this region of Florida. We give you praise and we give you thanks for it. In your mighty name, we pray. And all the people of God said, Amen. Praise the Lord. You know what? 
I'm looking forward to hear a great report from Pastor Ben that the good works that God is already doing here among you, that it will increase even more. And your loved one will be sitting on these uh, chairs and uh, be on their way to heaven. Amen. Do you have anything to close with, Pastor?